second in a series of three webinars that we'll be doing for um, all the NABO members to helping getting y'all prepared, getting y'all ready for when we have our advocacy agenda that will come out in January. Um, all this stuff is to help you prepare so when everyone's here in June, you have plenty of time to digest, understand, ask questions. Um, but I'm gonna keep my remarks brief. Today, we're gonna talk about understanding our executive branch. But first, I wanna start by introducing our lovely National Advocacy Committee. And I'll let Dr. Jan kick us off. Aloha, everyone. I'm your advocacy chair. Um, and I want to make sure everyone knows about the WBC coming up and getting excited about seeing you in person in Austin, Texas. So um, lovely to have you here and invite anyone that's interested in advocacy to this call. And Dell's doing a fantastic job putting together these slides in this series of advocacy 101, 102, and 103, as well as our committee members that are working hard to bring advocacy to your regions. And so um, enjoy the presentation today and I'll let Elle take it away. Thanks so much, Dr. Jan. I'm taking myself off so people can hopefully see the next speaker. Um, we're going to go through all the members on the National Advocacy Committee. So next up, and I've asked each of them um, if they can say why they applied to be on the National Advocacy Committee. So you can get to meet these ladies and understand why they think advocacy is important to them. So next up is Sandy Clitter. Hi, everybody. I hope I see a lot of your wonderful faces in Austin next week. Um, I wanted to be on the advocacy, advocacy committee because this stuff doesn't come naturally to me. It's something I had to learn and learn through NABO from the ground up. And I want everybody to know that it really is for everyone. You don't have to be a policy wonk to get involved and um, tell your elected representatives what you as a woman business owner needs. Thanks, Al, for everything. Thank you. And as you can see on your screen, those are all the chapters that Sandy is connecting with, reaching out to if we have something that we need to spread the word about. Um, so if you've, I know you've probably already heard from her, but now you've seen her face as well. All right, next up, Bevan Evans. Bevan. Hi, everyone. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, I am from the Cleveland chapter, and the reason I joined the uh, advocacy committee is a lot like Sandy's. This is relatively new to me, and I knew that it was something that I wanted to get involved with and learn how to do and make it more accessible to the members of my chapter. So what I'm learning is I'm trying to pass that along to the members of my chapter, and hopefully that makes uh, them more excited about advocacy for themselves and for other women business owners. So that's my two cents. And I will also be in Austin next week and look forward to seeing everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Bevan. Next up, Rachel Cab Efron. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm an attorney. And so I love, love, love advocacy. And I love like being in the room where it happens and finding out how the sausage gets made. And I think that um, people sometimes discount the need for advocacy to like, that it doesn't affect me. It's like such a macro thing. And I think NABO has really brought it to like individuals. And so I just love that we can make, you know, changes in our state and our um, locality and with, you know, NABO's help nationally. So, and I love like how organized it is about the litmus test. So um, just think there it's, you know, I just love it. So. That's that. Thanks, Rachel. And next up is LaCheryl. I think she's on the line. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is LaCheryl Dodge. I am a member in the Alabama chapter. Um, I'm also a licensed attorney. And uh, what made me apply for the advocacy committee would be when I met Dr. Janet for our event that we had in Alabama and Mobile, where I'm from uh, this summer and talking with her and talking about what the whole underlying premise is for the advocacy committee within NABO. 
it was just something that I felt I needed to be a part of because it essentially represents everything that I am, a woman business owner, and I'm an advocate as well. So I'm happy to be here. I look forward to seeing everybody in Austin next week. And good morning. Perfect. Thank you so much, LaCheryl. And last but not least, who covers a lot of the California chapters, um, Julie Ashmore. Hello. <laughs> thanks, Elle. Uh, hello, Novel World. Um, it's great to be with you today. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to share um, why uh, we um, made application for, um, for the committee and to be of service to the organization. I appreciate that. Um, for me, um, it's a combination of things, and I think when I reflect back, it's really about the history of NABO and what NABO is, and to know that I wouldn't be here, literally, um, in building my business without those women um, uh, building this organization, and the structure that it has, the mission that it has from an advocacy standpoint, the leadership that we have, and the structure around it, again, the lit litmus test that was mentioned, um, makes it an easy lean, <laughs> lean into and to be a part of. And so it gives me an opportunity to give back. For me personally, um, my career and uh, with the chapter, as well as my uh, personal career and client work lend itself to that, as well as um, my education and experience political science. Um, I also uh, work a lot in the state and local tax area. Um, as well as economic development. So it's an opportunity to help my members understand um, the process to be good advocates for themselves and for policymakers to understand that we have a voice and that most of the time it impacts women um, in a unique and different way. And um, so any help that I can be to help our members um, bring that forward, I, I wanna be a part of that. So thank you. Thanks so much, Julie. So I hope everyone now has put a face to the names of the women that I, I get to talk to twice a month on this call. And um, we have a monthly call as well where we go through legislation. They also do a lot of work that you don't know about. Um, working through putting uh, legislation through the litmus test, looking at what we should be advocating for. Um, there's a lot of stuff that these ladies do, um, these women do on behalf of you. So I wanted each of you to meet them and to understand um, that it's a it's a commitment, but it's a commitment that's very, I think, fulfilling. Um, so I'm glad to be working with these ladies this year. And um, since Julie is the political science major, she can correct me if I say anything wrong today. <laughs> All right, let's get into the nitty gritty. Long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the power of the executive branch. The executive branch is what we're talking about today. Last month, we talked about the legislative branch. And next month, we're going to be talking about how NABO kind of fits into each level and how we can advocate at different levels of, um, of the government. So the president of the United States, if you haven't heard this before, I'm sure you'll you'll hear it on a call after I'm saying it. We call the president in Washington, D.C., we call him POTUS. Him, I'm only saying him because that's it is a he right now. Um, so POTUS, or the president of the United States, we all know is the head of state, but also the commander in chief of the armed forces. And that is his house. If you come to advocacy days, you can take a stroll by it. So um, that is the White House. Um, what do his powers, um, the president's powers, he or she's powers, um, what do they allow for? There's a lot, a lot that you hear about on a daily basis and then some things that you might forget about um, because you haven't had civics in a while. Um, he, he or she can sign or veto legislation and then it will take two thirds of the chambers in the legislative branch to override that veto. D diplomacy with other nations, negotiate and sign treaties. But we learned last month that the Senate has to ratify those treaties. Um, also nominates judges to the Supreme Court, issues executive orders, which we'll get into a little bit later, which um, and also extend pardons and clemency, clemencies for federal crimes. That's been in the news more than probably we would ever realize. 
um, recently. All right, next up. What is the president responsible for? A little variation on what we've been talking about, but it's implementing and enforcing the laws that Congress wrote. And he also performs the State of the Union. That's part of his responsibilities. What qualifies someone to run for office? 35 years of age, natural born citizen, lived in the United States for 14 years, and elected by the Electoral College, not by popular vote. The role of the vice president. The primary responsibility of the vice president is to assume the role of president if the pre president cannot perform his or her duties. Um, we see that a lot more in movies than we see it in real life. Um, they also serve as the president of the Senate and cast the deciding vote in case of a tie. Recently, that's happened more than um, it used to in the past. Fun fact, 48 of the vice presidents, of the 48 vice presidents, nine have succeeded presidents and five have been elected in their own right. So just a little fun fact to remember. All right, next up. Our current vice president, Vice President Harris, is the first woman vice president and the first woman of color. So very big milestone for women in the United States. The vice president's office. So when you come to D.C. and you see the White House and you know that the West Wing is where the president's office is, the vice president does have offices in the West Wing, but then also the Eisenhower Executive Office Building is the vice president's office building. So who runs all this stuff? Because the president doesn't have his hands in everything because there's just way too much. It's the executive office of the president. So the White House chief of staff oversees what we call the EOP, um, again, it's DC, lots of acronyms. Um, some positions are confirmed by Congress, others are at the discretion of a president. So there may be a role that the president decides is something that he wants in his executive office. And then the next president could decide, she could say, hey, never mind, I don't want that position. We're going to remove that position and hire this other position. Um, visible ones that you know about. Communications office, the press secretary, the people that you see on your TV screen when you're looking at a press conference, those are the, the visible ones from the executive office of the president. Less visible, the National Security Council, so that they advise on foreign policy issues. Other offices, there's the White House military office, there's the office of presidential advance, because when the president travels, there's a team of people that travel in advance of the president. <laughs> Um, to make sure that everything runs smoothly. So these are some other offices that are within that office. The role of the cabinet and federal agencies. So we all know that the president has a cabinet and also several, many, many federal agencies that are the day-to-day -day enforcement. They, you know, they, they're the administrators of these federal laws. Let's dive a little deeper into that. So the makeup of the executive branch, there's 16 executive departments, there's executive agencies, there's 50 plus independent federal commissions. I can definitely not name them all. Um, we've got ambassadors, federal offices, such as what we just discussed, which was the executive office of the vice pre of the president, and then office of management and budget, which is an important one, which we'll get into later. Um, more than 4 million employees, this does include the armed services, but more than 4 million employees in this branch of government. The cabinet, 16 executive departments. They're appointed by POTUS, confirmed by the Senate. All of them are secretaries except two caveats. The Justice Department goes by Attorney General, and the SBA, which actually became a cabinet level position, goes by the administrator, the SBA administrator. The um, SBA administrator was added during the Obama administration. Um, it was Karen Mills at the time when um, that got elevated. 
all of the different cabinet departments. A lot of these you've heard about, some a little more obscure, are agriculture, commerce, defense, not surprisingly, the largest agency, education, energy, health and human services, homeland security, housing and urban development. All of these have secretaries. Um, Department of the Interior, Justice, Labor, State, Transportation, Treasury, Veteran Affairs, and then the Small Business Administration, which came in 2012, which is important because that means when he has cabinet level meetings, our voices are in the room. Before that, prior to that, small business did not have a voice in the room for cabinet level meetings. Regulations. So Congress passes a law, a regulation, releases the requirements for that law, and it's issued by the agencies. They're implementing these laws. So it's not just what they write in the law, it's also how the law is implemented that will impact business owners. So sometimes it, uh, it's happened uh, many times where um, a regulation will come about and we'll be looking at what, what does that mean for small business? Did Congress understand what their law that they were writing, the regulations that would come down the pipeline afterward? All right. There's three main approaches to um, a regulation. There's command and control, which is basically the agency sets forth methods, materials, processes. Um, many people would argue that implementing all these nitty gritty pieces into the regular into the regulations could be, and many times it's expensive for small business and it can stifle innovation. So then they look at performance-based. So how can we set a regulation that ultimately gets to our goal, but maybe isn't as um, regimented towards the business? And I'm just talking about business-related reg regulations. Um, and then there's management-based, which basically the business owner can say, hey, this is how I'm planning to implement Let's say it's um, something with EPA and like emitting gases or something like that. This is the regulatory plan that I'm going to put together to make sure that we aren't releasing X amount of gases at X percentage a day. Um, then a regulator could then look at the plan and they could decide, okay, that's good. That's a management-based regulation. All right. The regulatory process. It can get a little complicated. Um, I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, Bailey is reviewing the chat box right now. So if you have questions, is if, if it's something that she can't answer right away, um, we will, we're will we taking down the questions and we will put your email in the chat and we will um, email the answers back to you if she can't do it live. I uh, just wanted to throw that out there. So the pre-ruled stage. The agency is granted the authority by the law to put together the proposed regulation. They may look at alternative solutions. They may look at cost benefit analysis. They, um, per, they propose these findings. The president, excuse me, sorry, I'm like getting a frog in my throat. Um, they propose these findings and then they will issue the regulation. However, Semi-annually, you can look at what are the regulations that are coming down the pike, and that's the unified agenda. So before, before the year even starts, you kind of can know what agencies are planning, whether or not they get to it, that's one thing, but you can kind of pre-plan, okay, this law passed, they're going to be putting this regulation, they're going to be proposing it in like this six-month period, we need to be on the lookout. Um next step. So when you're looking at a proposed rule, if you're not a lawyer, um, it's a, a pretty long document. It has a preamble, preamble, there's a summary of issues, There, they put in there what date you need to comment by, which we're going to get to in a second. There's supplementary information, you know, like they're going to put what data they already have in there. And then there's a full text written of what that proposed rule is. 
So it's going to go through the nitty gritty of what they want you to accomplish, whether it's a management, you know, depending on what type of rule it is that we talked about earlier. If it's command control, performance-based, management-based. All right, we're going to look at the homepages of these websites, but when you're looking for the proposed rule, the notice of the proposed rulemaking will be on the federalregister.gov. And then you'll, when you want to make a comment on a rule, which many of our chapters and as a national organization, we've commented on regulations before. It's part of when you can be an advocate. Um, that you would go to regulations.gov and you can see all the rulemaking documents. And then that, that's where you would input your comments. And it, you normally from the proposed rule to comment period, it's normally about 60 days. A lot of times when there is a rule that has a disproportionate burden to small business, you'll see them extend the deadline because small businesses haven't had time to make um, thorough, like thorough comments. Like they'll say, we need more time. And then that's kind of how that works. Then in the final rule stage, um, the agency then goes and reviews all the comments from the National Association of Women Business Centers, from individual business centers across the country. They review all of them, and then they prepare the final rule. And in the final rule, they will reference questions and will provide answers to a lot of questions in the text. Um, and then to further explain the rule, once it is after the final stages and once it's published, they can also put together guidance documents. So guidance documents are there to basically try to explain whatever legal jargon they have put together to set forth the rule. The guidance documents will provide clarity and will say, we're going to take this down. Now that isn't part of the regulation. It is solely to provide clarity, but it is helpful to business owners when you're trying to understand what the government is asking you to do. Um, we're going to go, we're going to dive a little bit deeper. How does the president, what is his or her role in this process? So the president and the office of information and regulatory affairs, if you're in DC, everybody just calls it OIRA, another great acronym. They review all the draft proposed rules prior to publication. So they also review draft final rules because sometimes, just because we like to make it really, really complicated, sometimes a rule can go directly to final. If it's a state of emergency, there's like economic reasons that they give, um, it's a significant issue, they can go direct final rule, but they do have to be reviewed by um but you're, there may not be a comment period, I guess is what I'm saying for some, for some rules. Um, and then the president also looks at a rule before it is final. So when the, prior to them being proposed, there can be a review period. And then prior to the final, there can be a review period. Um, I'm trying to think like, for example, when there was, um, waters of the United States, which many people, it was, you know, like where the water was going to impact and how it was going to impact businesses. And um, there were EPA rules and all these people were saying that it was going to be disproportionate to small business. Um, they, the president was looking at that rule very intently because they were getting so much feedback. So it depends on a lot of times while they do look at it, depending on the elevation of the regulatory issue depends on how much you're going to see um, more or you're going to hear more about it. Um, how does Congress get involved? So the the regulations, just as Congress proposes, proposes the law, once the regulation is written and new final rules are out, they're sent to Congress and then they're sent to GAO before they officially take effect. Um, oh, and I'm, I apologize. I did an acronym before saying the word. The Government Accountability Office. We just call it GAO. I forgot to put that in parentheses. Um, major rules with OIRA. So that's the 
office that I was just talking about require 60 days. Like Congress says, give us, you need to give us 60 days to review it. Minor ones, um, it, they don't have as much time. Now, the House and Senate can pass a resolution of dis disapproval, but the president must sign that disapproval for, before it can become void. It takes a hell of a lot to get to that point. Um, changes can be also made through new legislation. For example, I can give you an example of what we're dealing with right now. Um, we've sent comments on the independent contractor ruling and the, the test that the, um, the administration has proposed for independent contractors. We sent in our comments, um, but we've also already teed up Hill offices that when this becomes final, and small businesses are going to have issues with it, what are you going to do about it? Because then it's going to be in your hands. Because Congress will be the only people that will be able to roll back whatever's been done. So they're aware. Next up, how can the courts get involved? You can go to court and you can say how the rule will or has damaged or will adversely affect your business. Um, a court can consider a rule unconstitutional if they believe that the rule has gone beyond, further than what the agency has authority to propose. Like if they, if the agency puts together a rule and they're like, oh, this doesn't jive with the legislation, you're going outside the realm or the boundary, the rule can be sent back to the agency. So it's not, per se, that the rule dissolves and is gone, they will send that rule back to the agency to fix it if they decide that they've gone outside of the bounds of their agency, the agency's authority. Who do we work with? Because there is an office that we work with. Um, it is called the SBA Office of Advocacy. That's who get involved in, gets involved in the process, in the regulatory process on your behalf. So you can go to sba.gov backslash advocacy and you can get on their email list. They'll, they'll let you know I'm, I'm on them for you. But um, if you want to do it yourself, you are welcome to. You can get on their list. And what they what they do is they issue regulatory alerts. So they will alert you when there is a rule that they know will have a disproportionate burden on small business. What's interesting about this office is, it is, is that it is underneath, it is in the SBA, they're housed within the SBA, but they are an independent office. So the head of that office, now granted there hasn't been a head since the Obama administration, um, the interim head is the person, so basically um, that person would then go to the administration and talk to OIRA and tell them that they don't agree with them. In um, previous administrations, when there was a person in this role, they are appointed, they are appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, but then they're going back to the person that appointed them to say that they don't agree with them. So it puts them in a little bit of a dicey situation, um, but it is um, a position that NABO has said before that we we um, we think that they should they should have someone in the role because without someone in the role, you don't have someone speaking on your behalf. You only have the interim person. Um, but it doesn't seem like it's a pressing issue right now for them. Um, lawyers bring concerns. So basically within the SBA Office of Advocacy, there's a research arm and there's also like legal, there are lawyers that work in all these different issue areas. So there's a lawyer working on your behalf with EPA. There's a lawyer working on your behalf if it's a regulation that has to do with um, Department of Labor. Um, there are lawyers that are then going, have built relationships with these agency uh, in the rulemaking, in the rulemaking process that are working with their, their staffs to say, hey, you're doing this. It would work for big business, but when you do it to small business, they're going to have to close because it's, they're not going to be able to afford it. Or it's, 
too regular, it's too burdensome. Like they're not going to be able to get, jump through all these hoops and continue to keep their business running. So that's the office that we go to a lot to say, hey, are y'all looking into this? Or, hey, we've looked into this and this is what we're hearing from members. And um, that office is actually utilized NABO's comments within their comments to these agencies. And when they're talking to them behind the scenes and then when they actually do their own formal comment letters. So there's always offices that you don't necessarily know about. Ah, so the Federal Register, you're really interested in what's going on, where are all these rules, where, where can I find them, I want to read all of them, I want to drink my coffee and read this stuff, this is where you go. Uh, federalregister.gov, you can go into current, as you can see on your screen, you can go into the current issues with the Federal Register, you can look into regular filings, you can search for a regulation, and you can look at recent executive orders. Um, and then you can also see that what is in regular filings, I put a note there at 845 and then it's published the next day in the register. So they post it there and then the next day it goes into the official register. Regulations.gov. So this is where I was talking about, let's say your chapter um, decides they, they've look, looked into some regulations, they don't agree with it. They, it, you know, looking at the litmus test, it's something that um, they think, you know, looking at the data, looking at coalition building, they've worked it through and they, you as a chapter believe, or NABO National as, a, as an organization believes that we need to communicate our concerns. You would go in there, you could look up this specific rule, and then um, you type it in, and then I'm gonna get to the next page, which is gonna show you where the comments are. But before I jump there, because I'm going faster than um, the slides, you can see where new comments are due soon because comments will have a deadline and you'll have to send it in by then. But then you can see where comments are posted, like the most recent um, regulations are posted and then what's trending. So you can also look at regulations.gov and see what everybody's reading to know what's probably a hot button topic. Um, all right, next up. Sorry, it did not click. Okay. This is where once you search it, then you're gonna click on, see where it says comments. That's where you would go in and be able to put in your comment or search for comments. Um, these websites are a little wonky. I wouldn't say that they're like the best organized, um, but you can go in there and you can figure out, um, you could go in and make your own comment on the regulation yourself or as your own chapter. All right. So um, we've gone through a lot. Let's kind of look at these definitions a little bit, just so we can kind of recap where we were. What what have we talked about? Elle said a lot of Greek. Um, and I'm already like shifting slides and not meaning to. Okay, so proposed rule, notice of a proposed rulemaking. That, that's the official announcement. So that was that first part of the process where we see what the problem is. Like we we see how they're trying to address it. We haven't gotten our fingers in it yet. We haven't gotten to put our put our two cents in, but that's what the agency, that's where they're coming from. That's what they think they want to do. In our interim final rule, that's that tricky rule that I was talking about earlier, that it becomes effective upon publication. That's like when there's a catastrophic event and we've got to put a regulation in to prevent people from harming getting like hurt. Um, direct final, um, proposed rule is unnecessary because we know it's gonna be uncontroversial. That's something that sometimes they utilize. We don't see that a whole lot, but it is another definition to take note of. And then an interpretive rule, that's when the agency explains how their like how they've written it, how they interpret it, 
what who who is this going to apply to what things do we need to know how are you going to comply um it doesn't it isn't a new like legal standard it's just helping with clarity so it's kind of more like the guidance documents um not oh i legal standard sorry i could not think of that in my head um okay acronyms so what did we learn about today we learned that um l and bailey and meredith and katie may use the word potus not president uh vp that y'all have probably all heard nprm that's what when people are talking about this all the time they're not going to say a notice of proposed rulemaking they're going to say an nprm oira the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Remember, that's the office that reviews everything with the president. And then the SBA Office of Advocacy. That was the small independent office within the Small Business Administration that looks at rules on your behalf and looks to see if they will have a disproportionate burden on small business. All right. Throwing this out there again. If you have any questions about advocacy or advocacy in a box, that document that I've sent out to folks, um, there's my email or you've met all of your National Advocacy Committee members, you could reach out to them too. Um, I hope to see everyone so soon. That's why the call is this week um, in Austin. And um, we are also Meredith West from the Senate uh, Small Business Committee. Senate SBC, if you want acronyms today, um, she will be with us. She'll be doing a session. So I'm going to be reaching out to y'all to let y'all know when that special session is for advocacy. Um, she wants to hear what's going on with your businesses. She wants to be able to bring that back to ranking member Ernst and the Senate Small Business Committee. So for all you advocacy junkies out there, you'll get a little taste during the National Women's Business Conference as well. Um, for all next gen folks, don't forget that's on the 17th. And because we always like to tell you what's a looking ahead, uh, we hope to see you in Charlotte as well. And I am going to take it off the stop sharing my screen so we can see each other. Is everybody a little overwhelmed? Or are we feeling good? You can take off your mute buttons. We can chat. Feeling uh, good. Overwhelmed. No. <laughs> it's a lot. It is just it's a lot. A lot. You know, Elle, this was wonderful. I'm I am a policy wonk and I've dealt with state government for decades. And this was a I've been out of it for a number of years. This was a great refresher. I got a little rusty. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Th this is why we've done this. And, um, you know, your National Ad Advocacy Committee went through all these slides and told me what made sense and what didn't. So I'm glad that it made sense to you all. And I'm glad um, it was helpful because we all learn about this stuff, but we learned about it decades ago. And you can't expect to remember if you're not in it on a day-to-day -day basis. But it, it is important to understand because when we advocate, we need to know all the nooks and crannies that we need to be advocating in. Y'all did a great job of, of collapsing some very dense information into relatively easy ways to get there, even if we have to go back and reference slides. That's the goal. So I'm glad, I'm glad. Beautiful Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I was just going to say. Beautiful presentation. Thank you so much for putting that together, Elle. Welcome. Yeah, and when I when we had the when the committee had the privilege of the sneak preview um, before uh, with both 101 and 102, you know, as I was going through, I'm going like, huh, I didn't. Oh, I I didn't know that, <laughs> or I didn't remember that. Whatever. Did anyone have any questions, Meredith or Bailey? Um, did anyone have anything that we wanted to talk about? I wasn't able to follow the chat. Um, so there was a question in here from 
Rebecca about um, SBA rules. Rebecca, were you asking if SBA puts out rules or about the timeline for SBA comment periods on rules? Thank you. It, more so along the lines of do they regularly release rules during the year? I'm very familiar with the inpatient proposed rule system and outpatient because I am a healthcare consultant, but I didn't know if the SBA regularly did something similar that, so I could keep an eye out for it. SBA does have its own regulatory purview as well. Um, a lot of times it deals with size standards. That's like normally where the most controversial mm -hmm. ones come out. Um, but yes, they do issue rules as well. And they'll also sometimes have rules around different um, SBA procurement programs as well, like the women's, uh, the women own small business program or the 8A program or, you know, other procurement programs that they're running. Mm -hmm. Is that helpful, Rebecca? Uh, hey, I, this is Karen Reimer from the Kansas City chapter. Um, I'm wondering if you have developed any kind of a tentative agenda or area of focus that you want to be using for the advocacy days coming up in spring, the, in June. What, what do you think the focus will be? I think we're going to continue a lot of what we've been talking about la that we were talking about last year, which included, uh -huh. um, which included the micro business owner workforce issues, are still in play. Um, we're still continuing to look for ways to address the need for women business owners to be able to provide benefits, but benefits in an affordable way. Um, yeah. We're looking at, um, and you know when your brain is on like one topic and then you're shifting. Uh, digital, digital and financial literacy. Yes, digital. And thank you. See, this is why there we have a team of people. Um, digital and financial literacy, because still we know um, there is still a problem where women aren't able to get loans as readily as men. Um, and we're right. still looking at ways to ensure that women have that financial education. We also know that our members are still looking for tools to... Um, capitalize on the digital marketplace and how can we um, talk to Congress about what they can do from an agency standpoint. For example, um, a lot a lot of like small business development centers, the women business centers, you know, a lot of these these programs should be instituting modern tools. So when you go, you can utilize them for free services to help advance your business. So that's that's going to be something mm -hmm. that I'm sure will come down the pike again. Um, Dr. Jan. Caregiving options for women business owners. I couldn't even understand you. I'm sorry. Oh, caregiv caregiving. Caregiving. Yes, yes. Caregiving. Mm. So not only the business owner who has to be a caretaker for a family member, but also employees and how we're going to handle employees that are also caretakers and also just the strain of being a business owner and what is the government going to do to kind of recognize the need for telehealth, the changing environment for medicine. Um, we still need affordable health care. That's still an issue for small business owners. Um, and it's something that we're still talking about um, with members of Congress. Um, and I'm sure there's more that I'm not thinking about, but those are. Okay. Top yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So, thanks. So, Elle, will you be asking for our input or do you want just some input now? Hey, well, I will well, take input whenever you want to give it. Well, this is okay, your organization. So, okay, cool. So one of the things I think about is disability people with disabilities going in, starting a new business and they can't do it all they don't have energy and i think about medicare and how it allows um healthcare workers to provide services and you can pay family members blah blah so i'm thinking well what supports are there or do we need new supports for people with disabilities and and maybe dis maybe age related can be a disability and um, how can we help women entrepreneurs who are flooded with tasks to get additional support to keep their household or just maybe get get their ADLs done, activities of daily living, and run a business? So if you can't meet your ADLs, if you can't get food, 
or can't make food, you get it, but then you can't make it, then you're sunk. And everything about the business can go south and, and it won't work. So what I'm wondering is, is can we can we ask for supports for that situation? Then the other thing that came up in our chapter here in Austin is uh, I surveyed our group and we had an interesting response, mostly from not from members, but we had a few non-members uh, uh, respond to the survey as well. And our biggest need was getting capital, accessing capital. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that um, accessing capital, and you know, um, Liz, I don't know if, if you can recall this or not, or I, I don't know if you were on a call where we talked about this, you know, HR 5050 that NABO was so pivotal, pivotal in mm -hmm. um, was when in 1988 was the first time where women could go take out a loan by themselves without oh. a male co-sponsor. So if you look at, if that was 1988 and we're only in the 2020s, um, that curve is, we're still in it. <laughs> We're still trying to, you know, get, meet that feat. Um, so don't worry, access to capital will be front and center. Um, that's something that we hear from women business owners constantly. And unfortunately, it's, you know, we're dealing with climbing an uphill battle that, you know, because we weren't our independent selves in 1988, that's why it's, um, it's not an excuse, but that's what we're, that was the hand we were dealt. And that's what we're, we're working with. As far as the di disability stuff, we partner with um, an organization um, that's called Disability N, and they're on the small business roundtable with us. Um, and that might be something that we can look at some coalition building around um, to see what we can do in the disability space and with the disability community um, to kind of see how we can support um, women with disabilities in their entrepreneurial endeavors. So um, a quick question about that. I have a very strong and long history in the disability area, working for social the social security program in different states. Um, so <laughs> I, that's about, about all I can think about. Are you, are you looking for people to be a part of that um, conversation or not? Yeah, I, I, I will reach out to you as we continue to look into all of the different options for the agenda. Of course, of course. And we'll be on this call every month. So um, we can continue to have that dialogue. Of course. You you are my resources. You are where I learn what's going on. Um, so that's, you know, this is your organization and I have to hear from you in order to understand what we need to advocate for. So that's just part of the process. Um, yes, I think Trudy, I think you had your hand up and then Susan. I did. Um, hello, everyone. I just, I know somebody mentioned the Hello Alice lawsuit and I think Bailey responded that we would just circle back. I just wanted to just say that it's definitely something of concern, especially also the SBA um, 8A certification mm -hmm. that's also being blocked. So I definitely hope that we can at least address that at some point in time. Um, because... I will tell you, I can tell you that your NABO national board chair was at a meeting at the White House today talking about all these concerns. And that's something that NABO is definitely looking into and seeing what, you know, what we can do, where can, like, let's have the dialogue, but we're in the information gathering stage for it. Um, but I don't want you to think that we haven't been thinking about it. Your board chair was at the White House today talking about it. So um, it is front and front and center and it is being looked into okay thank you for that <laughs> I know sometimes like you don't hear all the things that we're doing but it's you have to ask the question because then we can answer it um all right Susan I oh it's good to mm -hmm. see you hey good to see you um, or your hand. <laughs> uh we uh continue in the language industry to see an uptick in worker classification issues um okay. we are uh, we've got noise going on in Minnesota, Michigan, New Jersey, West Virginia, that would be added to the list of other states. And I know that um, if states have a Democratic Senate, House, and and governor, then you're sort of in a uh, more dangerous position if they are in, in Democrat-owned uh, 
or represented, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess knowing more about that, and I do know that there are some Democrats that tend to be more union type focus. I'm going to use an example of a Bernie Sanders, for example, um, and maybe being able to go to the, if you will, the heart of the issue and being able to represent uh, small business. Because for us in the language industry, we are primarily an independent contractor type of a model because it's not every day that I need a TWI interpreter, for example. And my my peers and colleagues would be the same. They don't have a need every day. But together, we would be able to utilize the services of that TWI interpreter, for example. So I'm just trying to figure out, I know we've got it on our agenda, and I know we do it at NABO Plus, also in the language industry, but I guess I want to know what more we can do. What what does this look like on a on a bigger scale to really get to the heart of the issue? Because we're seeing this pop up more and more and more and more. And um, I don't know how, you know, we're trying to fight it on a state by state level. But at the end of the day, that's that's a lot. And once it comes down the pike of um from the administration, you're going to be in a whole different scenario. Um, have you reached out to the Office of Advocacy yet? I don't think we've talked about that. Have Have you reached out to them, and do you have you told them or recommended um, anything for your industry specific? Office of Advocacy for what? For NABO? For um, no, for government? the Small Business Administration. Yep. Yeah, we're in touch with them. Um, you know, Bill is somebody that uh, works, uh, we work with very closely on this and he is in touch with the SBA. But um, I mean, I can see that this also might affect a lot of us here as well. Oh, definitely. So um, I think the stronger voice together, obviously I need to reach out to uh, NABO in Minnesota, Michigan, New Jersey, and West Virginia as well, because I don't know if it's on their radar or if any of you know that um making sure also that you're just there's so many levels that we need to be in touch with in the government in our local city and state op options mm -hmm. so making sure that we are doing that and that we, we we've got an exercise of a of a software and i don't know if you have it l that kind of gives us a, a privy of what's going on i'm sorry i thought it was on video that gives us a privy of what it is um, maybe could come down the pipeline that gives us an extra um, mm -hmm. idea, an extra layer of a, hey, this could be coming down the pike. And we're utilizing that at with the ALC, but I don't know if it's something that we also use at NABO. Um, you mean on a national level or on a state level? All of the above. Okay. We do it on a national level, but um, yeah. not on every state level. Okay. And we do have that. We're doing a trial right now of the one that's on the state level because that's where a lot of these things start is on that city state level. And then of course it then comes out nationally and federally. So uh, we're trying to keep an eye on it all the way across the board. So um, yeah, I don't know what the next steps are. And maybe this is a continued conversation that we can have next week when we are in Austin. I'd Sounds love great. To, I'd love to be able to continue the conversation brainstorm because I always feel like our voices together, we're stronger together than we are independently by ourselves. Of course, definitely. Thank you so much. I will, I will be there so we can chat. Oh, and I get to give you a hug. I'm excited. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. I know we've only got a minute left. Dr. Jan, did you have anything that any remarks you wanted to make before we head out? Raise your hand if I'm going to uh -huh. see you next. Is it next week already? Awesome. awesome. I leave Saturday already. So yeah. Great. I leave Saturday too. Yay. Awesome. Delta Airlines. Me too. See come. you, Dr. Gina and everybody. Can't wait. Dr. Jane, did you have anything? Thank you for being here, everyone. And I just wanted to make a quick ask is to, you know, let's all of us invite one or two of our, you know, members or non-members to this call next month. And let's create a bigger connection, a bigger voice and a broader reach. 
right, for Novo and, and for women business owners out there. So I look forward to seeing you all in Austin. And if you're not coming, then I'll look forward to seeing you on our next call. Mahalo. Karen, did you have Safe anything? Travel. I saw your hand. I saw your hand, Karen. Did you have anything? You said raise your hand and I wasn't on camera, so I raised my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, what day of the week is it? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Al. Thank y'all so much. I look forward Thank to you, seeing yeah. everyone and bring a friend next month. Two friends. I expect to see two friends from everybody. Love it. Thank you, Al. Thank y'all so much. Aloha. Thank you.